Hi, so I was recently asked to give a bit more explanation on copper nanoparticles. Now, I've done a fair few things on copper nanoparticles before, um, but the reason I was asked to give a bit more explanation is it's looked at quite a lot for making inkjet inks. And that's understandable. People want to print conductive tracts. It's a, a big and important issue in printing conductive electronics and flexible electronics. The reason people choose copper is it's a hell of a lot cheaper than silver. But copper brings with it its associated problems. It's fairly reactive, so it'll oxidise quickly, particularly when it's small. Now, forming small copper nanoparticles actually isn't that much of a challenge. It's really just a matter of mucking around with the process conditions. And it makes a lot of sense. If you have um, a highly concentrated copper solution, an awful lot of copper ions kicking around in there, you reduce them to copper, the chances of them hitting another lump of copper is pretty high. Copper likes to agglomerate, actually all nanoparticles like to agglomerate. So having a high concentration and a high chance of them whacking into each other gives you a very high chance of agglomeration, and that's exactly what they'll do. So if you use concentrated solutions, then you're going to get very large particulate sizes. So a simple way of controlling the size of your nanoparticle formulation is to make weak solutions, just use less concentration of copper salt. And that way, because it's well dispersed, you're decreasing the chances of the copper particles hitting each other and therefore decreasing the chance of forming large agglomerations. Now, they will agglomerate, they will collect together. However uh, weak those solutions are, they will form particles. They just love to. So what you do is you put something in there to stop them forming particles. You put a capping agent in there. If you put quite a lot of capping agent and quite a very little copper, you'll get very small particles. Now the morphology will change depending on the process conditions that you do it in. So if you do it in a microwave reactor where the reaction happens extraordinarily quickly, then you're, not, you're going to get one shape of copper particle. If you do it by mixer stirrer, you're going to get another shape. There's a whole load of different ways of approaching a synthesis that will have an effect on the actual shape of the particle. Now, so will the capping agent. If you use different capping agents, then you're going to get different particular shapes from um, spheroids, cuboids, flower shapes. All of this stuff has been well researched in the literature. A quick read of anything about um, now, a particular formation will give you these ideas. So, one of the things is a weak solution. Another one is an appropriate capping agent. Another one is an appropriate synthesis condition. Which synthesis condition you choose? So there's lots of ways of manipulating that sort of stuff. Now, I have quite an interest in copper nanoparticles because I have particularly interest in, uh, interest in uh, photosintering uh, nanoparticles into conductive tracts. And one of the problems with copper nanoparticles, is, or any nanoparticle actually, is to get them to disperse. It's quite challenging. So you need to stop them oxidising, you need to stop them agglomerating, you need to increase their ability of dispersion. And there's a kind of a, a process that I came across that I've mixed with a uh, new process, if you like, for the production of copper nanoparticles that are dispersible readily in an aqueous solution. And it caps them with gelatin. Now this is uh, pigskin gelatin, as it happens, and it's uh, 300 bloom. And if you reduce your copper in gelatin, again playing around with concentrations, you get different particle sizes. But the particles themselves get coated in gelatin, and that makes them dispersible in water. So the capping agent there is water dispersible. And you don't have to coat them in gelatin, you can hydrolyze the gelatin, so you stick it in a tub with a lot of sodium hydroxide and boil it for a bit, it'll break up the collagen into peptides, and you can use the uh, lower molecular weight peptides to act as a capping agent as well, making them water dispersible. But what we're going to do is to synthesize copper nanoparticles in gelatin as an example. So in order to get gelatin to dissolve, you need to heat it. Gelatin doesn't dissolve at room temperature. It's about 40, 45 degrees it'll actually dissolve. Now, this is a 10% solution of the gelatin, so there's 200 milliliters of water and 20 grams of gelatin in there, and I poured that in there about 10 minutes ago and let it swell, and as you can see, it swelled up. Now, in order to get that to actually melt and be a liquid, what I need to do is heat it to about 50 degrees centigrade, which is exactly what we've got here. So I'm going to heat that to 50 degrees centigrade and get it to melt. So once you've got the gelatin to uh, melt, and it's mixing up nicely in its water, and here we've got it stirring and melted at 55 degrees, you add your copper salt. There's a whole host of copper salts you can use. You can use water-soluble salts like copper chloride, copper sulfate, something like that. 
But here's a new idea that I don't think has been seen anywhere else. So it's a whole new synthesis. What I've got here is red copper oxide. It's an insoluble copper oxide. And if I pour that into my gelatin, and just leave it to stir, it will in fact form a homogeneous mixture. Now I'm putting on a mechanical stir, and it's one of the basic simple pieces of kit that everybody who's got a lab ought to have. But you can homogenize, homogenize it as well. And it takes about half an hour or so for that to spread throughout the gelatin solution that we've got there, and it will make a brick red solution. Now I've added 10 grams of copper oxide in there, which is quite a lot actually, because what I'm actually after are quite large copper particles. So I'm interested in making an actual brush printable or screen printable ink. I'm not really interested at the moment in an inkjet ink. But if you wanted to make nanoparticles, then what you would do is use less. Half a gram would be plenty, even less than that. That's a, a stage of experiment that you would go through to work out what kind of concentration you would put in there to see how it would affect the morphology of the particles formed. Now, normally you can't make copper nanoparticles out of um, an insoluble salt like this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce that using formic acid. Now, formic acid will turn the copper oxide first into copper formate and then reduce it down to copper metal. And that process means that we can control it through concentration we can control it through concentration to change the morphology and size of our copper nanoparticles. Now, as I said, this is actually a new synthesis. I haven't seen this anywhere. And I have noticed, um, particularly of late, some papers popping up that are clearly based on the work that I've been doing. Now I put these onto YouTube because I wanted to be general knowledge and it seems that some people think that because it's on YouTube and not in a peer-reviewed journal, it's fair game to steal it. Well, it isn't really. It's fair game to use it, it's fair game to repeat it, it's fair game to do a study on it, but really you shouldn't be stealing the ideas. You ought to have enough brain, enough sense, enough common decency to give credit where credit is due. So, please feel free to use the synthesis, please feel free to investigate the synthesis, but really, you ought to be giving credit where credit is due, and not stealing the idea and presenting it as your own. Anyway, that's enough of me being on my high horse about this. All you do is give that a stir for half an hour until it has been thoroughly mixed through in the gelatin solution. So here we are 20 minutes later and as you can see that's mixed up rather nicely and the whole thing is distributed with that throughout the gelatin. Now what I've got here is 40 millilitres of 85% um, formic acid and all I actually do is add the formic acid to that. And then just leave it alone. Now over the next few hours that will change colour. It'll go through from this brick red colour to orange to yellow to a kind of brownish colour. And here's one I actually did earlier so you get a colour comparison. So you can see how brick red that is and how brownish pink that is. Now when I made that first of all, then I've got this very pink at the bottom here. They're quite large copper particles coated in gelatin. Then it goes to this brownish colour here. They're much lighter uh, copper particles, again coated in gelatin. And right at the top, I've got this kind of blackish brown layer, and those are copper nanoparticles coated in gelatin. So when I made this previously, then this is exactly the steps I took, and that was just a colour comparison. So this thing will stir away for about six hours or so, going through those colour changes until it goes into that pink colour. When it got to that pink colour, then that's a sure indication that you've formed copper particles. Now, there is something really interesting about this, is that I don't actually have to leave it to stir. Because it's quite a strong gelatin solution, it's actually quite self-limiting for its expansion. So I can put this into the microwave, which is what we'll do in a minute. Now, I've used formic acid here, and the formic acid attacks the copper oxide, to turns into copper formate, and then the copper formate turns out into particulate copper. The reason I've done that is that copper formate will dissociate under photonic sintering or under heat to give off carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and copper. The copper will be deposited as pure copper using photonic sintering. 
it will deposit slightly better if there are a couple of nanoparticles already in there. So this is meant for a photonic citron ink. So we've got water dispersible copper nanoparticles and it doesn't really matter if there's any copper format still left in there because you paint it on, flash it, then the copper will grow starting from the copper nanoparticles into the next copper nanoparticle, sintering it as a conductive track. So that's why I've used copper format and it works really, really well. But copper format isn't the only thing you can use. You could use ascorbic acid in there if you wanted, or you could use a combination of things. So put some ascorbic acid and some copper formate in there to get your copper um, particles coated in gelatin. And as I say, you don't have to use gelatin. You can use hydrolyzed gelatin so that you're coating them in peptides. It'll do exactly the same kind of thing. It'll make it water dispersible, it'll make it reducible, and it'll make it very good for adding to ink formulations for photonic sintering. And as you can see, it's beginning to change its colour already. But what we're going to do now is take it and put it in the microwave. So I've poured off 75 millilitres for the microwave. One thing I forgot to mention was that you need to change the temperature of this from 50 up to 90. So you put this at 90 degrees centigrade. So here are our copper nanoparticle, uh, sorry, here is our copper oxide in formic acid and 10% gelatin solution. Pop it into the microwave at high for a few minutes. What you'll see happen is it will bubble up and it'll bubble up to about here. But because of the gelatin in there, it won't go any further. And that means that we can leave that in there for as long as we like until that red turns into pink. So after about five minutes, you can see it's gone um, from its brick red color to this kind of brownish orange color. Now it loses water through this process. So about halfway through, I add another 25 milliliters of water. Now I'm using formic acid in this. Formic acid is the stuff that you find in your kettle descaler. It's also the stuff that you find in ants. This is 85% formic acid, so you'll notice the gloves. Because if you get this in any cuts, it stings like mad. They used to get it by soaking ants in water. They get a whole lot of ants, stick them in a barrel, stir it around for a couple of days and get formic acid out of it. And it does sting. It smells very like vinegar. If you get it in a cut, it really, really, really hurts. I can't tell you how much it hurts. It's like liquid fire. It's horrible. So you need to wear gloves with it. If you're uncomfortable with using formic acid, you can use ascorbic acid. It just means that when you come to make an ink out of it, you've got ascorbic acid still left in there, and that can be a little difficult to get rid of. Whereas this goes all to copper formate, and the copper formate will just dissociate under photonic centering or heat back into copper and releasing just a bit of carbon dioxide and water. That's why I use formic acid. Anyway, we give it another five minutes, and that should go uh, from its brownish pink to its bright pink. Okay, so in the background you can see the um, gelatin and copper oxide and formic acid still stirring and that's going to take about six hours or so. This has been in the microwave and it's been in the microwave for about 12 minutes. And if you swirl it around you'll see a layer of pink at the bottom. That pink is the telltale colour for um, copper nanoparticles. And you can see it in the set version there, it's a very bright pink, that's copper that's come out. Now, as you leave that, you need to leave that at about 50 degrees, because if you leave it cooler, the gelatin will set. <coughs> and what you want to happen is the large particles sink to the bottom, the medium weight particles stay in the centre, and the lightweight particles go to the top, which is exactly what's happened here. So this centre layer here has a medium-sized gelatin-coated, water-dispersible copper nanoparticles already in a bit of copper formate for a photocentrine copper ink that will mix up quite well with water and a binder system, a carrier system and make good photocentering ink with copper nanoparticles in it. Now as I say you can add other things to that once you've done, there's no reason just to leave it as that jelly because that jelly is not oxygen set, that will oxidise and the copper will turn back to copper oxide. So you need to put an oxygen scavenger in there. Now lots of things like work as an oxygen scavenger, sodium sulfide, sodium thiosulfide, ascorbic acid, all of those things will take up the free oxygen and help keep that as copper nanoparticles until you're ready to turn it into an ink and center it. So there we go, a fairly interesting and unique synthesis of copper nanoparticles in gelatin for water dispersing um, photocentrable inks. I hope that was of interest to you and thank you very much for watching.